I will. I'm going to touch on L-O-J, the letters L-O-J, but we're going to hieroglyphically understand and seek to understand L-O-J and the significance with prophecy and scripture. So I want you to turn your Bibles, if you will, to um, Zechariah. I'm going to put this verse over here. Um, Zechariah, Zechariah 11 and uh, 7. Well, actually, 11 and, um, yeah, 11 and 7. 11 and 7. Now, let's first just break down a, a couple basics. Now, we touched on, um, in the first part of the intro of this, we touched on, actually, we touched on Rastafari. We put Ras here and put Safari right here. All right, we have Rastafari, right, or Rastafari. Then we have, in the Hebrew, we have Rosh, right, and we have Tiferet, Tiferet, right? I want you to keep that in mind, Rosh and Tiferet. Now, when we look at these right here, hieroglyphically understood, and we put them right side up, what we have here is the, what's known as the flail of ancient Egypt, the flail, right, the flail or Megareth, one can call it, or the cat of nine tails, in a sense, right? Um, and we look at this in ancient Egypt, right? And we have this symbol, or what's known as the crook, right? So we have the crook and the frail. This is the shepherd's rod, and this right here is what you call the, the whip or the Megareth, symbolic of punishment. Now, we're going to introduce, some of you may already know this particular book, um, and this particular book is called Egyptian Yoga. Egyptian Yoga, right here. Some of you may have seen this is by um, Muata Ashby. It's a very interesting writing, you understand, and it's one that we would recommend. Now, it has a lot of um, a lot of information in here, but there's a particular page here that we want to use as a as a source of reference. There's a couple of pages actually about this particular subject matter. Now on this particular page right here where it's comparing the ancient like Kabbalistic systems, you understand which we know from the Jewish Kabbalah, but then we go to the to the real ground of the reality and we have the so called ancient Egyptian um, mystery schools of the ancient Egyptian um systems which we know that Musa or Moses he was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians so this is also very very important for us to to compare and to contrast now here it introduces um, the flail now this is probably a better image of the flail let's see if we can give it to you You've probably have seen it before this particular image right here that's the L when we now look at it in its proper orientation. Now, we didn't touch on the O just yet. Now, the O in this Lion of Judah, this is Lion of Judah. Now, some would just have an LJ. They would say the O, why you put it there, just says of. Well, of is very significant because when we look at the Gutters, we have Moa Anbesa Ze'im, Ze'im, you understand? That M is is a very important word. It's not just like in them heart where it has yet. You understand? Yeah, Yehuda on Besal, but Moa on Besa that M negeta Yehuda is very significant. Now, this is the flail, right? The flail, right? And here it states on page 124 of Egyptian Yoga. It says the crook and flail are symbols of leadership. These are symbols of leadership. Now, this is what we point out, Zechariah 11 and 7. You understand? Know and it all has to do with Rastafari, you understand, know or the Rosh Tiferet. Now, what about Tiferet? But first, let's deal with the, the flail, and we're going to touch on the crook, or what's known as the crook and the flail. The crook and the flail are symbols of leadership, are symbols of leadership, right? The crook now... It symbolizes the ability to control or to lead one's forces. And the flail signifies the self-discipline needed 
to correct one's mistakes and to institute the proper, quote, punishment to oneself for not carrying out one's duty. This is very, very important. This is all part of the Mystery School of Christo. So let's put this down for a moment. Both these symbols are symbols of leadership. You understand? Or ras ship, or rose ship, or headship, right? And the crook now, this is the crook or the shepherd's rod. The shepherd's rod or the crook, it symbolizes the ability to control one's forces. You understand? To control one's forces. Let us say uh, control. We can put control or we can say lead, right? Control or lead, right? And then we have the flail, the flail, right? The flail, it signifies the self-discipline, the self-discipline. So we have self, you understand? And we have discipline. We put that discipline, and then it's also discipleship is linked to the self, which is ras, you understand, in the Ethiopic, ras means head, and ras means self. It's important for us to note that. It both means head, and in reference and use in language, it refers to self. So we have under the flail, which is the first symbol, or the L, you understand, the alternative to the L is the throne. Is actually the throne symbol. You understand, in ancient Egypt, you have the throne symbol somewhat similar to this, you understand, or, you know, somewhat symbol, symbolic to a seat or sometimes just represented as that kind of L right there, which is a seat, you know, the, 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 the seat or the throne, right, the throne symbol. But it's also, as well, it is the so-called um, right angle. It is the right angle symbol, and this is very important in, in building. It, it is a quarter. You, know, you could say it's a quarter of the square. Now, we're going to touch on the first elements, too. The science of the scripture in the Bible is beautiful when one can understand. In other words, how did the, the, the circle become the square? Because first was the circle, but the circle became the square. And the important thing about the circle and the square is that both of them are 360 degrees. So when you see a circle and you see a square, you're looking at an illusion. Basically, you're looking at an illusion. Because mathematically, they both are 360. They both are cipher. But how did the circle become, how did it turn itself inside out and it become a square or it squared itself or to square the circle, right? But now when we look at this symbol, which is a center symbol, we have this the circle or the cipher, right? We have the circle or the cipher, and then we have the dot. Now, the dot in the sense of it is very, is very important. This dot, let's see if we can put this dot right here, the dot in the center of the circle. Now, what's that dot in the center of the circle? Let's write it down, see if we can write it down here. The dot in the center of the circle, it equals, right? It actually equals Tiferet. It actually equals Tiferet. Now, if you go to ancient Egypt or go to the ancient Egyptic knowledge, you will find this very same symbol right here as the Egyptian array, array, or the first letter in Aras Tiferet. So this letter right here equals this symbol or the circle with the dot in it, the circle with the dot in the center. Now, when we study the Kabbalistic tree of life, you know what I'm saying? We recognize that the tree corresponds to increasing levels of evolving consciousness. And so we're touching on we're touching on the seven enemy occupying nations in the promised land or in the Kanaan, and we're talking about the opening of the book, the book of life or the tree of life, and the loosing or the unbinding of the seven seals in man. Touching on each each occupying force each particular place, you understand, as we work our way from low degrees to high degrees. So we began with the root or the base, but now this symbol right here is important for us to note that this symbol right here, you understand, is Tiferet, the circle and the dot, and it's also known as Ra or Re. So 
often you have as R-A, but more correctly, it will be R-E. You know what I'm saying? R-E or the sound like in, in Spanish or um, um, the, those languages, like the Spanish is like re, re. You understand the re. Now in Latin you have rex, you know, but that also is coming from the re, ra'i, like ra'i revelation. So we have re. So we have this right here. We can write this ra'i, which in Ethiopic refers to the vision in the sense of the revelation. Re revelation. So we have both. We have Rastafari. You understand? We have Rastafari and we have Rastafari revelation. We have Rastafari and we have revelation right here. And now this is a circle and a dot. So we have the flail and we have the crook. And now we have to understand that self-punishment, because this symbolizes self-discipline, you understand? Self-discipline and the proper, quote, punishment to oneself for not carrying out one's duty. But self-punishment here should not be confused to mean some form of um, masochism. It's not masochism, because masochism is an extreme behavior which is in contravention to what's known in Egyptic logic as the ma'at. It's in contravention to what we know as so-called balance or siddic or righteousness. It's in contravention. It's opposite of that, right? The balance. Discipline can be as simple as an act of not allowing oneself to have dessert if they smoke the cigarette, you understand? Or, you know, that sort of example of a basic discipline. Now, what's interesting is that the writer here goes on to connect this also with something at the root chakra. If we study this from the root chakra, it gives a lot of, it gives a lot of one's, um, many challenges come on the root chakra is the base of the spine but it's also the sexual center so it's also interesting to break down the LOJ you know saying hieroglyphically see the L as the flail see the J as the crook you understand and then see or the shepherd's rod and then see this O you understand or the cipher with the dot in it you understand as the tiferet kabbalistically speaking or array you understand, know Egyptically speaking, or the Arai, or when we look at, I think the next sabbatical coming up is Re'e, uh, R-E-E-H, and that basically means to see. What's interesting is that um, there's a name that a lot of Christians gravitate to, and this name they say Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Jireh. Well, in the language it's Yahweh Yireh, Yireh. So it's not Jaira, but it's Yere, Yere, and Yere, you understand? Jaira, Yere means to see. So you probably have seen this written, written as a J I R E H. So you have a J I R E H, Jehovah Jaira. But really, it's Yere. He will see in the sense that he will provide. He will provide the vision. He will fulfill the vision. You understand? Almost like when we look at the Egyptian eye broken down in an algebraic way, you understand, the missing elements. He will fill in those missing elements and will fulfill what is necessary for his vision. So to understand the full, the consistent link from ancient days to the modern revelation of Aras the Fari, a breakdown hieroglyphically of L.O.J. is very, very important. But now... The article here, excuse me for a moment, the article here, the article here now goes on to basically discuss, discuss an issue concerning the sexual fire. Remember the root chakra, the first chakra is the sexual fire chakra or the base chakra. Now, sexual fire is one of the strongest forces that ground us, that ground us, um, to the earth. Overindulgence, it leaves subconscious impressions which make us believe or be naive that true pleasure or happiness may be found only 
only through some activity of the body. Now, see, this is not only confine itself to sexual pleasure. Because so there's the other pleasures that people find the only happiness through those activities, physical activities, which also are related to that same center. In fact, these other activities tend to make up, you understand, for maybe a lack of maybe the sexual activities, you understand, which are more healthy, usually because of wrong socialization or sociology. So when it speaks about being born again, being regenerated, we have to confront these sort of issues in true Christian and true Christianity confronts these issues. Even in the Gospels, it's beautiful to understand these things, but then when people read many areas of the Gospel, which are even talking, even Hawaii Apollos, he goes on to actually speak about the so-called Genesis, but most people don't recognize it because the way it's been translated, you understand, as members is a little bit is a little bit clouded because they use members in different ways. But in this way, in the Gospels, it's actually speaking about these members that are at our root chakra or our sexual core. You understand? But moving on with what um, Brother Muata Ashby wrote in, in um, Egyptian Yoga, the philosophy of enlightenment, he goes on to state that in reality, these erroneous impressions, they are impressions, just like impressions that go on a record when you play a record, like a broken record, it becomes an impression you understand, are setting us up for a disappointment since at the very least sexual activity cannot, and even in the best of situation, cannot go on indefinitely. It cannot go on indefinitely. These impressions subconsciously impel us to continuously search for more, quote, carnal, carnal gratification. So when we as a Rastafari from the core of Rastafari teach and say, um, I and I not want no carnal mind, there must be an app for that. There must be an application that helps to strengthen us, make us aware, recognize, and overcome this. You understand? And there's many people who want to overcome these things, but the teachings, the presentation hasn't. They've been told, well, just pray instead of study the Bible. You know what I mean? Instead of apply what you are learning as you study the Bible. Not just the Jesus loves part, but the other part that now help us to gain a better self-discipline as, w as well as ability to control or lead oneself on that path that we have chosen. You understand? In God and in spirit and in truth. So these impressions subconsciously impel us to continuously search for more co-carnal gratification, pleasure at the level of the senses. In fact, there's another uh, connected teaching to this. It's um, a teaching that we've taught, lectured on before, but it teaches us about overcoming the Satan of the senses, the Satan of the senses, that yes, we have these five senses, but these five senses are actually our foolish senses. That what we need to do is to overcome the, the senses, you understand, which is the pleasure just at the level of the senses in order to open up our spiritual hearing, our spiritual seeing, our spiritual tasting, our spiritual hearing, our spiritual touching. You understand, to be able to touch the spiritual world. You understand, and we have everything in our tripartite being to do so, but there's a lot of worldly materialism. It's like a concrete. It's a concrete over that nature. So every once in a while we see the weeds, you understand, of the nature breaking through. But there's that concrete, that materialism, that prevents us to see the real ground. In other words, we're on top of this concrete, this artificial, you understand, this artificial construct. But we haven't got to the true ground of our being. You understand? So this pressure now to reenact the pleasurable occasion through physical, through physical must lead and must lead to mental agitation. Now that mental agitation has an adverse effect or defect on our nervous system, on our nervous system, you understand, even in not so overt ways. Sometimes that can erupt as the anger, as violence, as greed, as self-centeredness. It may not, you may not see somebody shaking, you understand, because what they will erupt, the anger, 
You understand? The violence erupts. You understand? The self-centeredness erupts as a kind of anesthetic in a sense. You understand? Um, analgesic even. You understand? To really feeling and overcoming and confronting the reality of their of whatever their situation, whatever I and I situation may be. So it leads to mental agitation, which inhibits. It inhibits. This is what inhibits the higher spiritual attainment. So ones and ones may say, well, yes, I've been reading, I study, and intellectually they understand it. But in their real day-to-day, you understand, way-to-way, you understand, so-called walk, they're not overcoming. So these teachings are very important. So furthermore, since the world, the world, the Gentile world construct that we are in is set up in such a way that we cannot have everything we want whenever we want it. We are liable to become disappointed repeatedly, repeatedly, and further become more mentally agitated, become more and more mentally, you know, disturbed. You understand? And then people will take pharmaceuticals and other kind of drugs or alcohol or whatever, even weed, to kind of escape. Not to spiritually rise, not using the wine in its proper way, but to become drunk, to deaden the senses. You understand? So, nature is trying, the nature, the netaru, the nature is trying to show us that sexual pleasure is only a glimpse of the true bliss which can be found by knowing, by knowing oneself. Now, that may be hard for some to really equate. Well, how are you saying that the sex is just showing us a glimpse of the real pleasure that we will have when we know ourselves? I don't think, I mean, I know who I am. You know, you, these are just kind of the impressions, the, the broken records that people have set up within them. You understand? Through the initiatic science, here the author says, of yoga. Through the initi- Now, what's interesting about yoga, just to break down yoga for a moment, if you go into the Sanskrit, yoga basically means a yoke. It's, it's a kind of a yoke. Now, when you do the math in the, in, in the Christ, in the Christian mystery school, you'll find that the word yoga in the Hindu teaching, the Eastern teaching, meaning a kind of a, a yoke, you understand, whether, whether it's a control or a harness, actually is what Christ said in, um, I think it's Matthew chapter 11, where Christ says, take my yoke, take my ember, you understand, my, my, take my yoke upon you, you understand, take my yoke upon you. And this is very interesting, because he said, take my discipline. He's saying, take my discipline like with the crook. And the and, and, and the, the crook right here, the shepherd's rod. You understand? Know the shepherd's rod. Take this yoke. Take this discipline upon you. You understand? Know and he says, learn. Next he says, learn of me. So the learning process in true Christian or true Christianity is something that's been neglected for a kind of a, um, an emotional, pseudo, um, feel-good faith kind of thing that said just believe, believe, and just shout and raise your hand and do all these physical activities. But then when people are apart from that, the disappointment, depression sets in. Because instead of teaching the people things that they can even meditate on and think about and pray on and work with, they're just giving them a feel-good moment right now, and then they pass around the offering plate and then collect. You know what I'm saying? That's the game that they're basically playing. So instead of us saying the initiatic science of yoga, we will say that we compare the yoga to the yoke that Christ says. Yoke and yoga, if you break down the etymology of these two words, yoke and yoga, you understand? Some would have it as the so-called Y-O-G-A, but then when you put the Y-O-K-E and understand that the A interchanges with the E, and in the ancient K and G, those K and G sounds also in the Shemitic and the ancient language interchanges with one another. So some words that are a K sound, you understand, actually have evolved out of a, 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 a G sound or vice versa. And it's interesting when you're studying um, the science of language and, and even basic level um, linguistics about, and this is what Gerald Macy's books 
you know, saying really gives you an introduction into that. So once again, we have to mention that. But the author goes on to say, if through developing wisdom, one learns to transform the energy developed from the disappointment into spiritual energy. Now, this is amazing, that you can actually take the energy that you find in so-called disappointment, and you can, as they say, the philosopher's stone, you can transmute you can actually transmute that disappointment energy you understand, into spiritual, into a higher energy. One will discover that there is a higher level of consciousness. That most are just stuck on that particular level. They're, they're like, like, like they say nowadays, you're in a zone. I was in a zone, man. You know, basically what they're saying is that I was stuck in a certain level of consciousness and I couldn't break out of this box. You know what I'm saying? I didn't know how to turn the square into a cipher. All my energy was getting stuck in the corners. I wasn't able to flip it inside out. You know what I'm saying? Either one way or the next, but both is 360. See, that's the 360 link to both the circle and the square. It's just an illusion. We're looking at an illusion. This is why we should not judge, as it says, don't judge by appearance, but judge by righteousness. But most have to first learn, well, if you, if I, I can't judge by, I shouldn't judge by appearances, I need to judge by righteousness. Well, question, what's the main question here? What's the main question? What is righteousness? You have to find out, well, what is true righteousness? But what most folks do repeatedly, even many of my dear brothers and sisters sometimes, is we will take our own opinionated, what we think or have believed is righteousness, and then when we're called to back that up with Jah word, back that up with the teachings of his majesty, back to that was something that is, that is proven, true, beside him. But people get upset because they're like, they don't want to admit, well, that's just my opinion, and my opinion may be wrong. They want to say, well, it's my opinion, and my opinion is right. See, that's another part of that self-centeredness. So that first chakra, when we talk about the root chakra and overcoming the enemy number one, uh, the so-called Hittites and the children of Het, you understand, or hate, you understand? That's very, very, that, that, the, the first step is the main step. You understand? The first step is that main step. And that first chakra is this also connected with the sexual fire chakra at the base, at the root. You understand? At the very base, at the root. And unfortunately, most people stay in that zone. And the color for that particular chakra is red. So think about it. They stay in the red zone. You know, if you know anything about animals, I mean, I remember being down south and some of my um, in-laws and relatives, they had bulls. They had a bull. And I remember they, were, they kept telling me I had this red, a couple of red shirts. They were like, don't wear the red shirt around the bull. You understand? I could see the sun and the bull in the distance right over there. And they said, if you wear a red shirt, I don't know if they were just telling me this or not, but what I've learned later on is that many animals are instinctual, you understand, to certain colors. You understand, they're instinctual. And now we can understand that for the animals, but man, for lack of a better expression, man is a higher form of animal. You understand, more responsibility and, and more application and, and, and capabilities have been placed in man, but man has descended to a very low level where he is only tapping into the lowest levels the more so-called animalistic and even bestial levels of his consciousness. You know what I'm saying? So we have to learn how to, trans, how to transmute that. So one will discover that there's a higher level of consciousness where instead of disappointment, one can experience boundless fulfillment, ecstasy even, and peace, even when something doesn't go the way that you want things to go. That is, that is really the key level. It's one thing to say it now, but when we're in that position, we've been personally there. And it takes a, a moment to really recognize the zone you're in. But if you are even acquainted with the spiritual teachings, the true teachings of Christ, and you love Christ and you're in Christ, you will have at least a default option. But if you don't even know it, you understand, it's not even in your, in your sphere of ideas or thoughts, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna, um, um, revert. You understand on those instinctual, you understand and lower level, you understand um, um, responses. You understand. So, what is your response ability? 
you know what I'm saying? What, what kind of response do you have to that? You can't really affect the next one, but you can affect yourself. So it says by directing the sexual energy inward, in other words, directing that sexual energy inward instead of outward, the power to discover who we are becomes potent. Now, one would not think that at the very first level of spiritual teaching, we're going to touch and we're touching on sex and sexual energy. You'd be like, well, that should be like later on. I mean, you, you know, they talk about whether to teach children sex education. Like, no, leave that to the, I mean, it's just crazy. It's a crazy, crazy world. Because even the parents might not know and don't teach this. Not even just teach, okay, birds and bees, male organ, female organ, but even how to transmute these sort of energies. You understand? And without that familiarity, ones have already lost before they've begun. So maintaining a moderate sex life or practicing total or partial celibacy, which is not for all people, and there's a total or partial celibacy even within the Christian teaching, tells ones that do not um, defraud one's partner, you understand, you know, um, for a time, you know, without consent, and it, it gives certain ground rules and regulations to show that even in that time, they understood these things. But most so-called Christian or Christians today, you know, saying they are, you know, they are, they are, they are like totally, totally um, devoid of this. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? It's just, I mean, this should be coming out of the church. You know what I'm saying? That's what the church is there. For the church is like a mother for the new Christians, somewhere where they can nurture them and grow them. But most folks can't talk about this in their, their, their church or with their so-called brothers and sisters in the Lord. You understand? Know but then when we study the scriptures, they're talking about all these kind of issues right there. You understand? Know That's why that church was able to grow. But it says that these are important so as not to waste this vital cosmic energy which is stored where? Now here's the key, at the base or in the base of the spine. In the base of the, 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 the spine. So now remember, we're such in the root chakra. The root chakra, the first of the seal, the root seal. You understand, know, the base of the spine which has to do with the order. You understand? Know, and here's where the teaching for this base level, this first level, is the orit or the Torah, the Torah portions. Now, one will say, well, how does that help with that? Well, first of all, study. You know, let's, let's study. One's not going to know it by, like, you know, so-called, you can't window shop ja. You can't window shop ja. You're going to have to enter in. You understand? So it says, um, which is stored in the base, the base of the spine. Also, the psychological process. There's a psychological process of, um, of directing one's energies. Now, here the author puts in parentheses thoughts, and this is very key, that one's energies are their thoughts. You know what I'm saying? One's energies are their thoughts. You know what I'm saying? So the psychological process of directing one's energies or thoughts to the sexual area prevents those energies from being directed and used elsewhere. So by directing your thoughts there, even in a protective way, it prevents you from wandering off, you understand, in other um, directions. Now, working with one's conscience or conscious will, the conscious will, you understand, to direct the sexual energies to the higher energy centers or the higher thoughts, you understand, one can experience the ecstasy of union and what's known as the seventh energy center orgasm, the seventh energy center orgasm or what they call the crown you understand that a crowning, uh, it's a crowning achievement, in other words. This holds true for males as well as females. So it's not gender bias for males only and not for females, but it holds true for males as well as for females. Now, this is not seen and not to be seen as so-called masturbation. So this is not seen as the obscene so-called masturbation. We need to understand. Orgasms at the highest levels of consciousness, which is known in ancient Egypt as the Uraeus, you understand, are experienced due to one due to union of oneself, oneself or one's ba, 
with the divine self or the universal ba, the neta netaru. You understand? Or we could say the king of kings. We could say the lord of lords with God, in other words, in spirit and in truth. Now, it's through training, practice, and will. Training, practice, and will. Training. You understand? That means learning, training, practice, practice what you're learning, and will. That means the conscious will. You understand? The conscious will. Taking, taking control in that sense. You understand? Of the situation. Taking control, you understand? Of the situation or over the devil, over the negative influence consciously. You understand? With one's thoughts. The ecstatic feelings and energies developed at the higher energy centers can be experienced at the physical level with a partner as well. And this is what's known as Egyptian um, Tantra Yoga in that sense. Now, as previously stated, now the author goes on to say there's many roads in, in yoga or many type of disciplines. You understand within um, yoga and anything in the universe may be utilized with the correct knowledge, attitude, and instruction. Sex may be used as a vehicle to unite with God. Now, of course, a lot of folks will say that's not um, so, but if you really study the scriptures, you will understand. But only if used in a disciplined and a spiritual manner with a partner or a spouse, you will saying, of equal um, qualifications, will, you know what I'm saying, and, willing, and willingness. Um, during intercourse, one should keep the teachings in mind. You know what I'm saying, always realizing that it is the body soul who is using the body and not the perishable ego, the ego personality. So really to see the difference between your perishable ego personality. I mean, we, we have to destroy our ego and build the ego up all the time. But most people get deluded thinking that the ego personality is their true or real self. In this manner, all activities, including sexual relationships or relations, are performed with this mental attitude of dispassion and detachment, thereby developing the witnessing bar or that aspect of our spirit that is actually witnessing. Gradually, it will be realized that while making love with a partner or one's partner, one is actually making love with oneself, and one will see the true oneness that even Genesis break down that oneness from the very beginning. You understand? Know but because of that shortcoming in the beginning, you understand? Know that basically threw everything out of alignment to this very day. One, some have been able to overcome it, but most are really born and, and were born in this world at a disadvantage. But some have been able to perceive it. Some have been able to be trained or to learn it. You understand? And some have been blessed with it. You understand? But we all need to work out our salvation. So I wanted to point that out. There was more actually to this hieroglyphic understanding of LOJ. Now, we had actually linked once again with a teaching that is relative to the, um, to the present um, study of the first uh, chakra, the root chakra, the base chakra at the base of the spine. Now, we have pointed out this, Zechariah 11, um, 11 and 7. You understand? 11 and 7. Now, we want you to study that. We're going to get into that a little bit more as we move forward. You understand? But 11 and 7, this is very interesting because here in this area of Zechariah 11 and 7, it actually points out that there are two, there are two, um, there are two rods, you understand, or what they call two staves, two staves that's called beauty and band. Literally, graciousness and union. Graciousness and union. The first signifying God's attitude towards his people of Israel in sending his son. And remember, Jesus Christos used the flail when he whipped out the money changes out of the, out of the temple. And now the second is his purpose to re reunite Judah and Ephraim. Judah and Ephraim. Now, Christ, at his first event, he came with grace to offer union and was sold for 30 pieces of silver. You understand? Beauty 
graciousness was cut in sunder, signifying that Judah was abandoned to the destruction foretold in verses 1 to 6 and fulfilled in A.D. 70. This is also our, the black Hebrew point of departure. You'll say A.D. 70, where even Josephus, Flavius Josephus mentions that many of the Israelites, when fleeing Vespasian and the Roman armies, fled into Africa, some into Egypt, some into Ethiopia. The Yorubas say that their ancestors came from Jerusalem. So all of this put together is very interesting to see the half of the story that hasn't been told by um, Gentile white supremacy. But after the betrayal of Adonai, or the Adoni for 30 pieces of silver bands, union was also broken, signifying the abandonment for the time of the purpose to reunite Judah and Israel. You understand? So even amongst us in this present time, black Hebrews and Israelites and those who have this particular Hebraic or Israelitish mentality, we can see the division even amongst us, whether the black Hebrew Israelites and Rastafari or the Beta Israel or the other African Israelites, we're divided even among ourselves. But there's a solution the Almighty puts here. So the order of Zechariah 11 is, one, there's the wrath against the land. There's the wrath that's against the land that's fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem after the rejection of the Moshiach or the Christ. Secondly, the cause of that wrath in the seal and the rejection of the Moshiach or the rejection of Christ. And then thirdly, there will be the rise of of the idol, the idol shepherd, which is symbolic of the beast, or the, the Kaiser Borgias, or the Caesar Borgias, or the blonde hair, blue eyes, so-called Jesus, who is the idol shepherd, or the symbol of the beast, and his destruction, and his destruction. So we already have seen all this fulfilled, so we're between the beast, or the idol shepherd rising up, you understand? Which is the whitewashed perversion of Christianity, particularly symbolic, symbolized by the Kaiser Borgias. Remember when the people rejected the Christ? They said, We have no king but Caesar. So, how easily would the lost sheep accept Kaiser or Caesar Borgias you know, as the idol, the, the, the idol, the, 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 the idol? The idolatry, can't even say this word, the idolatry, you know what I'm saying, the idolatry that it symbolizes. You know what I'm saying, the blonde here, the blue-eyed Jesus, the white Jesus. You know what I'm saying, this is all a part of the idol, shepherd, and the beast. Now, as we go into this a little bit more, we will see that in verse 14, and we, we, we're going to sum this up for, for a moment right here, and then we're going to return to it in another portion of this lecture, but Zechariah 11 and 14, it says, Then I cut asunder my other staff, bands, that I might break the brotherhood. There was a brotherhood between Judah, you understand, know and Israel. And it's significant that we as Rastafari are more representative of the elect of Judah. Now, why, why is that? Because Judah you know what I'm saying? The, the Judahites always held the Davidic, the Davidic monarchy. And Arastafari holding to Ketamawi Haile Selassie and the line of the tribe of Judah is holding to the line of the tribe of Judah. Now we have our other Israelitish brothers, you understand, and ones and ones and ones, whether the black Hebrew Israelites and, and others who don't hold, you know what I'm saying, to his imperial majesty or even really seriously recognize that. Now, it's interesting if you say the history of Israel, the same thing went on, especially after the divided kingdom of the time of Solomon and his, um, can I say, his idiot son Rehoboam. You know what I'm saying? By the time of Rehoboam, there was another son who renewed the kingdom, not of Solomon, according to Kevin and Neges, but the kingdom of David in the highlands that we know as Ethiopia. So we have to see that this brotherhood being broken between Judah and Israel is basically indicative of the predicament that we as a lost sheep are in right now in this division 
between the so-called black Hebrew Israelites, you understand, who have been taught, you understand, to hate the line of the tribe of Judah, the Davidic, the Davidic monarchy, which was always recognized by Judah. That's why the psalm says that in Judah is God known. His name is great in Israel, and so it is even in this very prophetic time. But more to come, y'all willing. Stay tuned. Shalom.